The government wants to crack down on armed citizen militias. Wait, isn't that in the Constitution? Oh, they're calling them right-wing extremists. Got it. Welcome to America Uncovered, I'm Chris Chappell. Forget about the age of Aquarius. To hear the mainstream media tell it, we're living in the age of far-right extremism. Many would have you believe that it's the greatest threat to the U.S., even greater than that rumored Ray Skywalker movie. Ugh. The existence of armed, allegedly far-right groups like the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, and the Proud Boys seem to validate their fears. Indeed, many call them paramilitaries to show just how dangerous they are. The mere sight of a bunch of men wielding guns together in public scares the heck out of people. Something needs to be done to stop them. That's why Democratic Senator Ed Markey and Representative Jamie Raskin have introduced a bill called the Preventing Private Paramilitary Activity Act. And the timing is just about perfect. The bill was introduced just days after the anniversary of the January 6th riot, which I'm sure has nothing to do with the fact that Raskin served on the January 6th Select Committee. According to a press release, the Preventing Private Paramilitary Activity Act would create a federal prohibition on paramilitary groups through civil and criminal enforcement. In that news release, Senator Markey warns that private paramilitary actors, such as the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers, pose a serious threat to democracy and the rule of law, and we must create new prohibitions on their unauthorized activities that interfere with the exercise of people's constitutional rights. The forces of bigotry, hatred, and violent extremism must be stopped for the sake of our democracy. There are an awful lot of assumptions in that statement. But assumptions aside, what does the bill do? Well, the bill cracks down on any group of three or more persons under a command structure for the purpose of functioning in public as a combat, combat support, law enforcement, or security services unit. Can someone please tell Tom Cruise that his security detail might soon count as a private paramilitary organization? More specifically, the bill would prohibit publicly patrolling, drilling, or engaging in techniques capable of causing bodily injury or death. Let me point out the language there. Capable. Not that you actually did break a law or hurt somebody, but capable. It also prohibits interfering with government proceedings, interfering with someone else exercising constitutional rights, falsely assuming the functions of law enforcement, and training to engage in the prohibited conduct mentioned while in a paramilitary group. Interfering with another person's exercise of any right under the Constitution? Oh, you mean like the new Black Panthers did in Philadelphia in 2008 when they stood outside a voting site with a truncheon? Don't worry, though. The bill does make exceptions for historic reenactments. This isn't just a reaction against the January 6th riot. It's part of a wider effort to crack down on paramilitary activities. More specifically, prohibiting the activities of armed citizen militias. In the U.S., there are quite a number of civilian groups that have taken it upon themselves to do things like provide security during protests, and even patrol the border without receiving government authority to do so. If you want to learn more about militias patrolling the border, I did an episode on that. I'll leave a link below. Now, according to the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project, or ACLID, there were over 80 militias across the U.S. in 2020, the vast majority of which are right-wing armed groups. What makes them right-wing? Well, the right-wing ideology of extreme violence toward communities opposed to their rhetoric and demands for dominance and control. You just described communists. Way to go. Supporters for citizen militias say the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution grants them the right to form citizen armies as a check on government tyranny when it says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed. But this makes many people nervous. What if militarized groups use that line of reasoning to justify attacks based on unfounded conspiracy theories? Wouldn't allowing these groups make us a society full of loose cannons? Stories like how three militia members plotted to kidnap Michigan's governor seems to affirm these fears, as does coverage of the January 6th riots, like when the New York Times reported that a former Oath Keeper said the militia planned to use any means necessary on January 6th. That's why many people want civilian militias entirely out of the picture. But is that legally feasible? I'll tell you after the break. Welcome back. 
The U.S. has state-led militias like the National Guard and Naval Militia. But does the U.S. Constitution allow for private citizen militias? Some say yes, so long as their activities don't violate laws. Florida State Attorney R.J. Lariza has argued the words a well-regulated militia refer to a well-trained and equipped force competent in the handling and use of their particular firearms, not a force that is subject to extensive government regulation. And historically, that's accurate. In the late 18th century, well-regulated meant practiced, not controlled by a government. George Washington was tired of his War of Independence soldiers showing up not knowing how to load a musket ball. Louise also believes that because the underlying purpose of the Second Amendment was to provide the people with a means to defend against oppressive and tyrannical government practices, a collective right to form citizen militias was created to provide the people with the means to defend against and ultimately eliminate oppressive and unconstitutional governmental acts which is also supported by other writings of the Founding Fathers of the time. More recently, though, federal law has two classes of militias. The organized militia, which consists of the National Guard and the Naval Militia, and the unorganized militia, all able-bodied males between the ages of 17 and 45. Each state has unique distinctions between organized and unorganized militias as well. Upon seeing the words unorganized militia, some conclude that anybody can just gather with weapons to form their own private militias without government authorization. However, in context, unorganized militia simply means the government can call upon the public to fight or serve in the military. Critics of citizen militias argue that the Second Amendment's defense of a well-regulated militia still entails subordination to the state governments and leaves no room for private armies. Of course, historically speaking, the state didn't quite mean what it means now as it did in the 18th century either. It was more like self-governing group of free people rather than a state of the union. And those silly wig wearers had a nasty habit of capitalizing all their nouns. However, the fact that Article 1, Section 8, Clause 16 of the U.S. Constitution gives Congress the power to organize, arm, and discipline the militia seems to indicate that the militia is supposed to be government controlled. This clause is widely understood to mean that the Constitution grants the federal government the power to call forth the militia, but leaves states the ability to appoint officers and to train their militias. Which leaves a lot of questions. After all, an unorganized, non-government controlled militia was pretty essential in the War of 1812, so yeah. That's why many don't like calling civilian militias militias, instead calling them private paramilitaries. According to a professor at the University of Michigan Law School, private paramilitary groups do not defend their country in the manner of a National Guard, but instead act as vigilantes against government officials to achieve their favored political ends. That's why she, like many who are concerned with far-right extremism, want to restrict militia slash paramilitary activity at the federal level. There's one woman who's leading the charge in that. I'll tell you who she is, Right after the break. Welcome back. Mary McCord, the executive director of Georgetown University's Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection, is a prominent voice in the push to restrict civilian militias at the federal level. She's worked with Representative Raskin to craft federal regulations against armed militias. And she wants you to know that citizen militias aren't constitutionally protected. To support her case, she cites two Supreme Court rulings. One of them is the 1886 Presser v. Illinois Court ruling, which holds that states can ban private citizens from forming personal military groups, drilling and parading to protect public peace, safety, and good order. That court ruling also says that military organization and military drill and parade under arms are subject to the regulation and control of the state and federal governments. It's unfortunate that the 1886 ruling also seems to argue that state governments can prohibit meetings of the people unless their own constitution says not to, even though that's pretty clearly outlined in the First Amendment of the federal constitution. I have questions. The 2008 District of Columbia v. Heller decision, which protected an individual right to bear arms for self-defense, affirms the idea that military organizations are subject to government control noting how the Second Amendment does not prevent the prohibition of private paramilitary organizations. 
Because of all this, according to McCord, a private militia that deploys itself without the permission of the state or federal government is illegal. She says that militia has never meant private militia answerable to themselves. It's always meant well-regulated by the state, reportable to the governor, trained and armed by the governor. Okay, but what if the governor and the state government are the ones being tyrannical? According to Georgetown University's Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection, which McCord leads, all 50 states have some sort of regulations that restrict private paramilitary organizations. For example, all but Georgia and New York have some sort of constitutional provisions requiring military subordination to civil authorities. 29 states outright prohibit unauthorized private militias. And 25 have statutes that criminalize certain paramilitary activity to prevent things like civil disorder. Because of all that, the Brennan Center for Justice argues that there is no authority under federal or state law for private individuals to form their own private armies. So does that mean that citizen militias can be outright banned? Well, not exactly. There's a reason why Georgetown's Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection, which by no means is a fan of citizen militias, is careful to note that it's not illegal to act as a private militia, such as by engaging in activities reserved for state militias. It doesn't explicitly say it's illegal for a citizen militia to exist. That's because the First Amendment right to free speech, assembly, and association, and the Second Amendment right for individuals to bear arms, makes things very tricky. It's one thing to penalize private militaries for breaking state and federal laws, doing things like impersonating a police officer, or combat training for the intent of civil disorder. Trying to outright ban citizen militias for simply existing opens up a whole can of legal and political worms. Now, it should be noted that partisan politics and the mainstream media have really tarnished discussions on the debate of armed citizen militias. It totally wouldn't surprise me if some of you automatically distrust those who say civilian militias aren't legitimate. I get it. Lots of people, including experts, seem to be letting personal politics influence their work. The court, for example, has made it her career to warm about extremism. She's a very popular go-to expert on that topic in the mainstream media. She was even one of those who made a big deal about extremism within the U.S. military, saying it's a serious problem that needs to be addressed immediately, back when the mainstream media was going crazy over it. Of course, ultimately, this Defense Department report found no evidence of disproportionate extremism within the military. It should also be noted that some people are still characterizing the January 6th riot like it was some kind of well-coordinated operation conducted by private paramilitaries, despite the fact that really wasn't the case. You're telling me that this is a private paramilitary operation? Aside from fear-mongering, there's also the fact that there seems to be a lot more scrutiny on so-called right-wing militias as opposed to left-wing ones, which may turn off a lot of people. Acklett, for example, said violent activities associated with Antifa have been minimal, which makes it sound like it's downplaying Antifa violence. Playing into mainstream media fear-mongering and downplaying fears average Americans have isn't really going to get a lot of trust if you want people to take you seriously about civilian militias. With loss of distrust in the mainstream media and the government, it's no wonder why more and more people seem to find civilian militias more and more appealing. Now, a lot of these conversations are a thing that YouTube considers too sensitive and wants to ban, which is why I'm hiding them in gaming content on my new show, Deep Thoughts While Gaming. Check out the latest about what happens when video games look this real. Yeah, that's not body cam footage, that's a video game. And as always, click on that orange button to support America Uncovered on Patreon. Even a dollar an episode helps us keep the lights on. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell, and you're watching America Uncovered.